Hello, everyone, and welcome to HR Options webinar series. I'm glad you could join us today. My name is Amy Julian. I'm the Vice President here at HR Options, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator for today's session. Today's topic is wellness programs. Are they a good investment? What does it take to create a wellness program? Well, here with us today is Ray Lee Olson from the Vita Benefits Group, who has years of experience evaluating, implementing, and managing wellness programs, among other things. Uh, Ray Lee is the CEO and a principal consultant with the Vita Benefits Group. Vita is a full-service employee benefits brokerage and consulting firm headquartered in Mountain View, California, in the Silicon Valley, and they are also a valued partner of HR Options. The team at Vita works with small, mid-size, and large employers, so pretty much everyone of every size, to implement, communicate, and manage all aspects of employee benefits plans. They're really known in the industry for their passion for excellence, extensive benefits knowledge, and amazing service. So Ray Lee is the perfect person to talk wellness programs with us today. But before I turn the mic over to Ray Lee, I want to just really quickly introduce HR Options to some of you who maybe are not familiar with our services. HR Options is an HR organization. We offer payrolling services and HR consulting support throughout North America, the USA and Canada. So um, please call me to discuss your contingent staffing situation. I would love to try and help you bring down your costs and improve your service. During the webinar today, please send your questions in throughout the program, if you have any, via the question box at the bottom of your screen. We're going to stop at a couple of different spots in the program to respond to questions that are relevant to that section, as well as at the end. So, you know, whatever works for you. But um, there is going to be an opportunity during the program to answer some of the questions that have come up. With that said, I'm ready to turn the mic over to Ray Lee to get started. Welcome, Ray Lee. Thank you, and thank, to, thank you to everyone for joining us today. Let me um, take a moment and go over what uh, I will see as the agenda for today. First, I'm going to make a case for wellness. Next, we'll look at the role of the employer in the wor wellness world. We'll then uh, move into taking a look at understanding effective elements of wellness. We'll look at a specific case study, elements that you may want to consider in implementing a wellness program in your uh, corporation. And then we'll, we'll finish with keys to success. I will also mention that I am going to speak very quickly. That's the nature of what I do in life. Um, we're going to cover a lot of material. There are there are a number of slides. They're intended to be a, vi a visual enhancement uh, to the words that I'm saying. They will move quickly, but they are available for you, um, as Amy will outline later as well. So let's dive right in and talk about the case for wellness. We'll look at demographic realities, healthcare cost trends, some American health and habits, um, and then finish with some thoughts on change. Diving right in, the demographic realities of our population today are startling, and they, are, they have a startling effect on the wellness of our population. So first of all, we are, we are growing older as a population. The fastest growing population is the boomers and the oldsters, the uh, say octogenarians, et cetera. The overall population is growing. We are currently at just over 300 million. Uh, we'll be at 400, nearly 440 million by 2050. Those are United States numbers. Then the uh, fastest growing segment of the working population is the 55 to 65 year olds because people are working, living longer um, and working longer as well. Life expectancy is also increasing. And the, all of those years that I'm just framing for you are the most extensive healthcare years that we as human beings have. Let's look at healthcare cost trending or spending trends. We are currently at two, over $2.3 billion as a percentage of the gross domestic product, it's increased from over just about 5% to almost 20% projected in 2017. And the cost per person um, is increasing exponentially. We're looking at a more than 100% cost increase in just a, a 10 to 15 year, excuse me, a 10 year period of time. Um, we were at $4,000 per person um, just a bit over a decade ago. Um, and then the employee composite number is just under $10,000, and that's a 2008 number. I'm looking at getting the 2009 numbers, which are coming off right now. Let me take a moment and put those numbers in perspective. 
So why would I have a picture of a Tyrannosaurus rex on the screen at this point? It's to make a point about how big $2.3 trillion is. Dinosaurs roamed the Earth 65 million years ago. That's a really big number. Now look at two, let's look at $2.3 trillion in comparison to 65 million years ago. That's a quick example of how big $2.3 billion really is, or trillion dollars really is, and how much we're really spending on our health care costs. So let's look at the drivers of health care. Number one, we have an aging population. Number two, we have technological advances that are more and more expensive. We have governmental cost shifting. We recognize that the government is paying less, private sector is being required to pay more, and that's causing health care costs to rise in, in exponentially. We have litigation costs, and we have declining health status. Now, you'll notice the declining health status on the right-hand side is the only one in red. You might ask, you might ask yourself, why? It's because that is the only one that we, specifically as employers, can do anything about. We're going to move now into looking at some of the realities of health in America. Look first at smoking. In the world, we have more than a billion people that are smoking. Upwards of 5 trillion cigarettes are, are produced and used on an annual basis. Here in the United States, we have 25 mil, oh, nearly 25 million men that smoke. We have over 20 million women that smoke. Kids of the 18, of age of 18 are picking up smoking at the alarming rate of 3,000 new smokers per day. Smoking-related diseases cost more than $150 billion per year, and importantly, it is the single largest preventative cause of disease in our society. Let's look next at alcohol. These are some pretty scary, scary statistics, but we need to look at them. These are the reports of people drinking five or more drinks in one day, 33% of adults and 55% of young people ages 18 to 25 report drinking five or more drinks per day at least once in the last 30 days. Looking, at, looking also at the driving under the influence numbers, 2.1 college millions reported drinking under the, under, driving under the influence in the last 30 days. And 10, almost 10% 10 of high school students reported drinking uh, uh, and driving in the last month as well. There are, and you'll see some numbers in here, both direct health costs and total costs, $22 billion direct cost, health cost for alcohol and alcohol-related problems, and then the total cost, which includes productivity from an employment perspective, is, is projected at $175 billion. If that, that's not bad enough, let's look at diabetes. We have over 20 million people in our country who are currently struggling with diabetes. We have an estimate, this is important, an estimated 41 million people ages 40 to 74 are in what we're calling a pre-diabetes phase. What that means is they're moving that direction unless the evasive action in their life is taking, the, is, is moving in a different direction. Importantly, diabetes leads to a number of very important and expensive health conditions, heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, kidney disease, um, complications of pregnancy. And you'll also see on the screen the, the, both the direct health care costs and the total co um, costs to employers, including productivity costs, of $175 billion and, and upwards of $250 billion. Once again, diabetes is among the most preventable diseases. The next category we're going to look at is food. And we're going to take a fair amount of time looking at this category. Importantly, the average daily caloric intake now is over 2,700 calories, which is up 300 calories per day from 1985, up 12% in a mere 15 years from 1985 to 2000, and it's even worse in the decade beyond. Here we have an increase in the allocation of refined grains, fats, sugars, vegetables, all across the board, everything except for meat and dairy is increasing in terms of our actual food consumption statistics in our country. And importantly, we have a new definition of food in our country. Uh, let's see, we're going to get a little bit of uh, building here. Well, the, yeah. slides, the slides seem to be a little bit finicky, so we'll leave them there. I'll give you the idea that um, coming up on your screen is what I'm calling the new definition of food. We have McDonald's, we have Taco Bell, we have Fruit Loops, we have ice cream bars, we have Frito-Lays, we have Oreos, we have Kentucky Fried Chicken, we have Wendy's. What you're seeing is everything is either fast food, processed, or packaged. 
And for many people, this is the definition of food. Here we have some details on those per capita food consumption statistics, looking at the difference from 1980 to 2007. Look at these numbers. First, look at our uh, flour and cereal products have increased by 50 pounds per person per year in that 27-year period of time. Oils and butters have increased substantially. Cream, cheese also, and importantly, high fructose corn sugar has gone from 19 pounds per person per year to 56 pounds per person per year. And we wonder about the diabetes statistics. So here's some reality about obesity. Obesity is defined as having a body mass index of 30 or higher. In our country, I'm going to take you through some slides, which some of you may have seen before, created by the Center for Disease Control, looking at the trends of obesity in our country from 1985 to 2009. Here we go. Starting in 1985, look at the, at the, at the, um, the colors as they change. 86, 87, 88, 89. 90, 91, 92, look at the color get darker, 93, 94, 95, look at it get darker, 96, 97, oh, we have a new category. That would be the category where 20% of the state is categorized as obese. There's more yellow, 99, 2000. 2001, we have another new color. 2002, look at the blues going away and the warm colors are taking over. 2004, 2005, now we have orange and dark orange. 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009. Remember the visual from 25 years before was almost all blue. The darkest color there indicates that over 30% of the population is categorized as obese. Our national weight statistics are as follows. We have 2% that are underweight, 37% that are at at a healthy weight, and 60% of people are above a healthy weight, with that split being 35% being overweight and 26% being classified as obese. Those are some very compelling statistics on making a case for wellness in our country. But many diets will fix this. Diets are good. Everybody's always on a diet. Let's look at some statistics about diets. In 1970, the average age of the girl who started dieting was 14. By 2000, that had fell to, fallen to age 9. 67% of dieters will regain all of their lost weight within one year, and virtually all will regain it within five years. And the diet industry is a $40 billion industry. That's billion with a B, not million. So I suggest to you we have a new suggestion for the evolution of man in our country. Let's change and look at something even sadder, and that is childhood obesity. We have an estimated 17% of children or adolescents to be between the age of 2 and 19 years old as overweight, and those, those statistics have increased over the period of time from um, the mid-80s to the, to the mid-2000s. What's important about that is in that 20-year time period, we've seen a significant increase in childhood diabetes. This chart shows you where it used to be in the early 60s. We were somewhere in the 5% range of childhood and adolescents being overweight in the 60s, and we're pushing 20% now in 2011. So what we have is we have a, a, a different reality. My slides are a little bit slow here. We have what I call the old and the new vis-a-vis children. This is the old And this is the new. And the activity versus the inactivity of our children is directly related to the obesity statistics that I've just given you. So do we really, truly have a new reality for our children, or do we need to do something about it? This all leads to what we call lifestyle diseases. We are a society of couch potatoes, and that that behavior translates to specific diseases. The ones that are on your screen in front of you right now, we have coronary artery disease, we have stroke, we have type 2 diabetes, hypertension, obesity, high high cholesterol. All of these things are related to uh, behaviors that are actually modifiable and, in fact, that will make a significant impact on health if they are modified. 
The American Heart Association has put out what they call their simple seven. Don't smoke, retain, have a normal BMI, exercise regularly, eat a healthy diet, keep your cholesterol low, keep your blood pressure low, keep your blood sugar low. In a study of 18,000 people, 0.01% of people followed all seven of the American Heart Association Simple Seven criteria for healthy living. That's 180 people out of 18,000 were able to maintain the Simple Seven. Those are scary statistics. So what's the problem we have vis-a-vis -vis your employment reality, your health care costs, your productivity costs? Our American expectations are that we will do whatever it is that we want to do and that our health care system will fix, our, will fix whatever problems we create in our own lives. We expect that whether we, could create, we contributed to them or not, the health care system will simply fix us. We'll get a pill. It will make it better. So we come to what I call the $64,000 question, and that is, well, isn't the federal health initiative going to fix all this? Weren't there wellness initiatives in the federal health care bill? Yes, but we have to look back before that. This is a government report put out by the Department of Health and Human Services in 2007. Look what it says. Their major conclusion was as follows. America must look beyond the health care system to improve the health of all Americans. That's pretty direct. Evidence tells us that whether or not a person gets sick in the first place has little to do with their health care. Here's another important statistic. Take a look at this one. Of concern for America is the high prevalence of people with unhealthy lifestyles and behaviors, such as insufficient exercise, overweight. These are risk factors for many chronic diseases and disabilities, including heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, and back pain. That's the result on the government report studying health in America. And so we come from what I call the $64,000 question, isn't our health care bill going to fix this? through the reality of what the voice of the government researchers said to what I'm going to call the million-dollar question, which is essentially taking a look at the wellness initiatives in the – well, let's take a look at the wellness initiatives in the PAPACA bill. There are four initiatives in the bill. It's important to recognize that the National Health Care Plan did nothing to change the, the real problem, the problem of our health, and there's little to retain to, to in the, that bill that's actually going to lower costs. I'm going to outline for you the four things relative to wellness that were included in our national health care bill. Number one is we now have required nutritional labeling for chain restaurants and um, fast food places. We have a prohibition on questions about guns or ammunition ownership on any wellness questionnaire. We have increased the penalty for the differential on wellness participation from 20% to 30%. And we have grants for small employers. The so grants for small employers, a lot of people are all hot and excited about those. Small employers with less than 100 employees, if they put in a bona fide wellness program, including health awareness initiatives, maximum, you know, to do things to maximize participation, have incentives and whatnot, then, in fact, isn't that awesome? Let me suggest to you that it's a lot less awesome than it sounds. And that is what was allocated to that grant was $20 million over a five-year period of time with the Health and Human Services to develop the details. If you do the math for the number of small employers eligible for that, that's $40.81 per employer, some total for the five years, available to fund wellness programs through grants. Now, certainly all the small employers that are eligible wouldn't apply. Even if 10% applied, that would be $408.10 per employer to fund a wellness initiative. Although it's a one-way conference call or webinar, I'm going to suggest that you should be chuckling now like, isn't that ridiculous? Even if only 1% of small employers adopted and applied for the grant and received it, then the maximum available would be just over $4,000 per employer, which does not, an empl which does not uh, a wellness program make. The point here is we're getting to the million-dollar question, and that is, do we have a health insurance crisis that's going to be solved legislatively, or do we, in fact, have a health care, a health, an actual health crisis. And I'm going to suggest to you that we have a health crisis, not a health insurance crisis, and that means that it can't really truly be solved on a legislative basis. So what I've done for you here is walk through the reality of some health issues, the reality of why wellness is a, is a buzzword today, the reality of the lack of health in our society. So wellness is the long-term answer, healthy eating. Notice there's nothing packaged on this, on this slide. And 
exercise, keeping ourselves moving. Those are two very critical elements of what the real true answers is. So what we know is that we are a smoking, drinking, stressed out, ho-ho eating population that in fact is not going to get any better unless we do something about it. And here's the bad news, folks. Here's the really, really bad news. The bad news is that these are not somebody else's employees. Folks, these are your employees. These are my employees. These are all of our employees. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to say, yeah, look at all those problems, but I don't have any of those. The fact of the matter is we all have them. The statistics will say that every single employer on this webinar has those employees and a good number of them as well. So let's take a moment before we go into questions, and I'm going to frame for you what I think one of the problems or some of the problems are for uh, wellness initiatives that we're going to get into. It goes like this. The problem is this is not simple stuff. I've just outlined a massive amount of statistical data, tried to summarize it into a quick and fun, if you will, summary of the sorry state of our society vis-a-vis -vis health. And there are some very significant hurdles in the, in, the, in the way of fixing this. Wellness has very real competition. What is the competition for wellness? Because we're going to talk about wellness in the, in the rest of the 45 minutes that we have. But the reality is advertising is competition for wellness. Greed is competition for wellness. Quick fixes and the belief in them is competition for real wellness. The fact that change is inherently difficult for people is competition for wellness. And wanting things to be easy and good is pure competition for wellness. The fact of the matter is our country didn't naturally drift toward where it is today. Our country was pushed there by some of these competitive pressures in our society. People didn't wake up thinking that McDonald's was the greatest thing since sliced bread. They had advertising to be sold that. All the products that have gotten us into the mess that we're in today, cigarettes, food products, alcohol, all of the things that I just talked about were products that were sold to people. They were pushed. We have been pushed there. And so the argument I'm trying to make is that we are not going to naturally drift toward wellness without an equal and opposite push in the other direction. So let's pause now and have Amy present to us questions that have been submitted. And then after we answer these questions, we will go in and we will look at, so what's the employer's role? What can we as employers do about this mess? Amy? And we're going to get into that real quick because there weren't a lot of questions that came in. One question was regarding um, the healthcare initiatives um, and the healthcare reform and wellness, where where do you recommend someone gets more information about um, healthcare reform uh, that that would be um, or the best source that you've seen for healthcare reform information? Um, well, I sort of wrote a book on it um, <laughs> that I'm happy to share. Uh, it summarizes and 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 also I think that. Um, Amy is doing a webinar on it, or we're doing a webinar where you can get information on all of the healthcare reform, not specifically focused on wellness, but I'm happy to share some of the information that I have written and summarized um, on the healthcare initiative if that would be helpful. Um, when you're talking I think about that's real, great that people can follow at, up with you. Yeah, if you're looking at real, true technical data, um, the, um, I mean, those of us who are geeks, get our data from the DOL directly on alerts where anything is posted on the Pataka legislation, I get an email and can go in and actually read the actual document. Um, so if you have a geeky type brain and really want that kind of detail, I can forward that information of how you can sign up for that service to get and, and give you links to the HHS website that keeps that information. I can forward that to Amy and have her forward that on to the webinar recipients. That's the kind of the real detailed information. If you want kind of summary information, I'm also happy to share the information that I've put together um, on National Health Care as well. 
Okay, great. Well, um, I, the, the only other questions have come in which are leading you right into your next questions, which, you know, if a company doesn't have a lot of money, whether they're big or small and they don't have the budget for wellness, you know, what are they supposed to be doing? And I know that that's what the, you know, you're going to be getting into now, wellness programs and well, that tees it up very nicely, Amy. I'm going to dive right into the role of the employer. And then after we talk about the role of the employer, then I actually am going to get into details of, okay, so what, I'm a small employer or I'm an employer that wants to do something. What is the best thing that I can do given the budget that I have? So when we look at the role of the employer, we're going to look at why employers, what's the real cost that we're talking about, what's the time horizon, what's the ROI realities in this wellness space, uh, what's the opportunity cost, and what do I think the landscape is today for employers vis be wellness. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Oh, my slide got a little bit weird there. Sorry about that. So the fact of the matter is why employers? Because I believe that employers are the single and only answer. It's employers that are going to be motivated to push against the, um, the com- competition to wellness that I framed just a few moments ago. Because employers have an inherent interest, and an economic interest, and a just because it's right interest. The fact of the matter is employers are the only entity that are poised with any leverage to do anything about moving the needle toward wellness. Let's look at the real cost. We as employers have a choice. We can continue flushing money down the drain, paying for illnesses as a result of the lack of our wellness. Or we can have a paradigm shift in our minds and say, we're going to redirect some of that money and move it toward creating a healthier population. Now, the Center for Disease Control indicates that 76% of overall health care cost is a result of modifiable behaviors. That means if we had a perfect world and everybody modified their behaviors to a perfect degree, our health care costs would go down by about 75%. Now, we're not going to have perfect adoption of that kind of an environment, but even if we took off 20%, imagine what it would be like to have your broker or consultant deliver your health care renewal and say, life's good, people are well, we're dropping the cost by 20%. The fact of the matter is we need to have an investment in wellness before we're ever going to get there. So understanding the time horizon is very critically important, and I'm going to give you a, a specific graphic um, picture of what I believe the time horizon is, and I'm going to do this intentionally so that you're going to be able to remember it, embed it in your brain, and fight what's out there on your C staff and with your shareholders, fight the reality. The fact of the matter is the time horizon is one of the enemies of wellness because the link between wellness and healthcare is very, it's, it's direct and it's known, but there's not a direct time. We can't say, if I invest today, here's how it's going to show up in my quarterly returns next quarter or next fiscal year. The fact of the matter is it's not necessarily cost-effective in the short term, and the question is, do you need to tie it to actual ROI? Now, I'm going to give you some ROI statistics, but I want to reframe that what you want to look at as employers looking at wellness programs, you want to think of what I call VOI value on investment rather than return on investment because much of it is not quantifiable and the time horizon is the really big problem. Now, here's the graphical interpretation. I want you to think about the decades that these pictures represent that I'm about to put on the screen for you. Nineteen fifty, nineteen sixties, nineteen seventies. we had the village people. 1980s, we had Saturday Night Fever. In the 90s, we had the Backstreet Boys. And today, oh, dear, that's very bad. Amy, we miss Lady Gaga. Um, (laughs) So the last one on there is Lady Gaga. The point of that little illustration is we need to be thinking of these, these things in decades, not in years, and most certainly not in quarters. We need to be thinking about, as employers, making changes that are going to be affecting our children and our children's children for the betterment of our entire society. And if, in fact, we are not willing to look at it on a decades-long basis, ultimately the investments are likely to be a flash in the pan. I do not mean to be a naysayer, but that is my opinion. The fact of the matter is it needs to be looked at on a very long-term basis and not tied to a quarterly ROI. Uh, report. 
So let's look at some specific enemies of the long-term investment. We have employee turnover. We have stock price push. We have quarterly earnings. We have short-term investment horizons. We have economic demands for ROI. You need to know those are your enemies. You cannot pretend that they don't exist. They are real. There is tremendous pressure behind them, and you need to be aware that there are specific stated enemies. But what are those realities? So ROI is difficult to measure. We, we have high health care premiums. We have suboptimal productivity. We have unhappy, unhealthy employees. And the potential return is that we have lower long-term health care costs. We have a happier, healthier society. We have the ability to manage preventable diseases. We have more productive employees. The, the, the potential return is very, is very uh, real. Now, if you remember nothing else from this presentation, remember the iceberg picture. Number one, 25% of health care, of the impact, the cost of the impact of poor health is above the waterline. It's about your health care costs, your medical costs, your Rx costs. 25% is above the waterline. And importantly, 75% is tied into the productivity side. It's absenteeism. It's presenteeism. My definition of presenteeism is when the lights are on and nobody's home, but you're paying them anyway. The fact of the matter is the lack of wellness, the unhealthiness in your population has direct health care cost impact on your health plan, absolutely unequivocally. It has a triple-fold effect on the productivity of your organization, both from an absenteeism and a presenteeism perspective. So what we know and what I'm painting is the opportunity cost is very, very high because the starting point is very, very low. We can go almost nowhere but up from here as presented in, in what I call the case for wellness. There really only is one place to go but up. And for some specific statistics, there are um, specifics that essentially outline excuse me, outline some ROI realities. This slide will show you that both employers, excuse me, employers and employees, when asked about the impact of wellness programs, will positively, affirmatively state that it matters and it makes a difference. Importantly, the numbers that are on the screen in front of you right now say these are the number of people who've changed their behavior because of an implemented wellness program at the employer level. That 89% of people are getting regular checkups. That's important for wellness. That 85% of people are, in, are intentionally trying to lose weight. These are important statistics and these are tied to wellness programs. Now let me give you some, some specific ROI numbers. And these are important because your C staff is going to want to know these and understand them. And I can give you, I can give Amy the references where these came from. But the range of ROI is at the high side, 1 to 1, 1 to 1.46, and it's at the low side, and the high side is 1 to 6. What that would mean is for every dollar you invest, you get a $6 return combined between direct health care costs, and indirect productivity costs. At the low end, it's for every dollar you, you invest, there's a 1.46 uh, return at the, at the low end. And this is from, these are from studies across the board. The bottom of this slide is important. There's a Harvard School of Public Health meta-analysis that essentially did an analysis of analyses. And they came up and said the direct health care ROI was over $3.00. And the absenteeism, presenteeism, productivity part was just under $3 from an element perspective. So those are some, there's some very, um, I'm not going into the details of the sources and whatnot. I can forward those to Amy to forward on to you. Um, but there, it's a pretty deep research that that meta-analysis meta did, which came out of the Harvard School of Public Health. So what is my opinion of the employer landscape today? In general, large employers are way ahead of small and medium-sized employers. 75% of very large employers already have some form of wellness program implemented. Initial solutions that really weren't very practical for small and, and medium-sized employers, you know, the large employers would hire big, huge consultants and spend millions of dollars implementing programs. And those aren't really very practical for small and mid-sized employers. But the good news is that that landscape is changing, and the opportunities are coming down market for smaller and mid-sized employers today to have much more canned kinds of uh, programs. And what canned means is not necessarily bad, but more cost-effective. 
So I'm going to pause here and see if there are any, any questions that have come up, and then we're going to dive into the real nitty-gritty of how to put together wellness programs and the elements of wellness programs. Amy? Well, um, we did have a couple questions come in, and it may be um, going into what you're going to be discussing, but uh, the first was um, it's difficult to push this kind of information out to employees and get them to care, get them to be engaged. A lot of it seems rather obvious to many employees, so they, their lack of interest seems to be prevalent. How can this really make a difference? Have you seen it? Is it, you know? I, I have seen it. I'm going to defer answering that question because I'm going to walk through what I have seen and, specific, and give you really specific ideas of how, what, what works and what doesn't work. So I'm going to okay, perfect. So, um, and then the other question is, um, you know, they know how to incentivize exercise and active lifestyles, but how does an employer incentivize um, healthy eating specifically? Well, that comes out of, it comes out of culture, and I believe that from an employer's perspective, it starts at home. Now, let me give you a specific example. At my company, we uh, purchase food for all of our employees, and they eat it here. Um, it's from a, for a convenience factor. Um, we've always done that. Over the years, things sort of crept onto the grocery list that weren't exactly the healthiest thing on planet Earth. And we did, we had, a, the employees called a, a meeting, and they essentially voted all junk food off the island. Oh, wow. The employees did that. Um, and we have a fully stocked salad bar. Now, understand, my company has 48 people on the payroll. There are about 35 people in my office here, in the local office, and then we've got some remote people. We have a fully stocked salad bar, kind of like a little mini fresh choice, where you can go in and get a salad, and it's got tomatoes and radishes and lettuce and tomatoes, and you can make a fresh sandwich with whole wheat bread. But you won't find any chips, and you won't find any cookies around this joint. Now, what the employees were really clear on is if somebody needs to stash M&Ms at their desk, they're really welcome to do that. There's no prohibition on eating whatever they want to eat. But we're not spending corporate money on buying uh, Coke, um, we're not spending corporate money on buying um, junk food. That's not helpful for people to eat. This is not my initiative. Now, I, I'm kind of a nutrition freak personally, so it, was, it, it wouldn't have worked for me as uh, to lead that charge. It has to be right. for the employees. And when it, when it came out of the employees, that was two years ago, and there hasn't been any junk food in our office, and they implemented it on a one-month trial basis, never came back. Well, so I don't know the right way to create that within your organization. And obviously a small office like ours has different challenges than a large office with multiple locations. So there are very unique challenges for different employers. But the most important thing is to know your culture and to make incremental changes to support that. So you can't control whether somebody's going to go out and have fast food that's not healthy for them at lunch. But you can control the environment that you do control. And I'm going to talk about putting in some incentives for, make, for um, providing incentive for them to make healthy choices when they're not at work as well. With that, okay. we have and with but with um, with with regard to that, also, I mean, isn't it the job of a broker like Vita um, for companies to come to you if you're implementing their wellness program and give them work with them to come up with ideas to target what will work for their 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 present their organization as a whole. Absolutely. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, what, that's what we do. I mean, we're kicking off a wellness program for a mid-sized law firm next week, um, and they don't have a lot of resources. Um, but what the most important thing for them, for advice I gave them, is they need to understand what are they trying to achieve. They need to understand what their long-term goal is, not their short-term goal, because I don't care about a short-term goal. I care about a long-term goal. And they need to know what kind of resources they're going to put, put to the table. And they needed to grapple with that. When they had answers to those questions, we're, we, we, we had an exciting conversation, and we're rolling out a good program. Great. Hey, one more question that's really a, a great question at this point is, what can you do to get the buy-in from the top management? Because all that you've talked about before is – are, are some of the, the things that we need. I think these slides give people ammo to go back to their C-level team to, to support wellness programs. Um, that's a perfect question. I'm going to delay it until I get to the place where I've got some of the framework and the slides. Okay. Because that is a critically important question, and I'll give you a, a preview of the answer, and that is the most important thing I'm going to tell you today is 
If you don't have C-level buy-in, don't bother. Period. Don't bother. Because if you don't have real, true C-level buy-in, what you will have is a flash in the pan. I cannot tell you how many HR people have come to me and said, oh, I want to do a wellness program. It's going to be great. It's going to be a wellness program. And I say, okay, well, tell me what your C-staff thinks about that. And they're like, well, you know, I'm kind of working on that. I don't really know. They're not really on board. I'm like, don't bother. Because whatever money you will spend will be wasted because it will be a short-term program with short-term results, which will just give the C-staff more ammunition for why it shouldn't have happened in the first place. So you, the question that's framed there is, the, is really, truly the perfect question. How do you get that buy-in, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But most importantly, uh, as HR people trying to drive this discussion, you need to know that sometimes no matter how badly you know it's right and how badly you want it, if you don't have support at the top, you probably should just wait until you do before you try to roll something out because it will, in my opinion, it will end up being a short-term solution if it's really tr truly not um, embedded in the culture all the way to the top of the organization. Okay, great. With that, let's dive into what exactly makes a wellness program. What are the components of a wellness program? I'm going to talk about some of those tools. I'm going to talk about the need to establish a baseline and metrics and the one-off programs that are out there, the comprehensive solutions, um, and then talk about incentives and the whole C staff question as well. So wellness tools. What is available in the tool chest, if you will? Now, I'm going to go way back to the basics. Most of you know all of this, but I'm just going to kind of cover all of it, and then we're going to get into detail. Health fairs. You can have health fairs. Is that a really big wellness thing? There are a lot of people who say, oh, yeah, we have a wellness program. We have a health fair. A health fair is good. It raises awareness. It falls in the nice but short-term category from my perspective. Preventive care benefits are important when you pay, and, and now they're mandated under the federal law, so that's a lot easier, but having those benefits is important. Health risk assessments or health, health risk questionnaires, those are very important because they establish that baseline and they give you as the employer information. Biometric screening is a tool in the tool shed that you may want to use. Um, mandatory video education. There are firms that will say, okay, everybody figures out a questionnaire. If you're a smoker, then you have to watch the video on smoking. Or if you're overweight, then you watch the overweight video. Or if you're um, a diabetic, you watch the diabetic support thing. There are, I mean, there's a lot of different options out there in the marketplace. There are truckloads of people who want to sell you stuff in the wellness world. On-site education classes. This is actually a really important one. If you want to create a culture of wellness, you need to bring the mountain to Mohammed. You need to bring people into your organization to talk it up because you need to have the resources right there handy. You can have nutrition education. You can have exercise classes. You can have fitness facilities on site. You can have stress reduction classes, smoking cessation programs, Weight Watchers programs. You can do all that. And an important part of making those tools effective is bringing them to your employees and not ha requiring that your employees go out into the world and get them. So we also have edu uh, educational materials. You can have old-fashioned newsletters. You can have web things, emails that push out to your employees. You can have um, gym facilities on site, or you can sponsor memberships to an off-site facility. You can have formal personal coaching and training. That is something that's been effective in some environments, either telephonic, um, in person, or by the Internet. All of those are available resources. You can do track tracking of key indicators. You can give everybody a little pedometer and then figure out how much they've walked and have little competitions and whatnot. Understand, there is a, there is a plethora of items that you can put together for a wellness program in your tool chest. And I just want to make sure you know that those are all the traditional ones that are out there. Just be aware that they're there and what they are. I'm going to talk for a moment about metrics. And I apologize, this slide got messed up as well. Um, this slide is about establishing a baseline. If you're going to do anything in the wellness space, you need to know where you are from a starting point standpoint. Why? Because at the end of the day, we are um, not, unless you're a completely nonprofit entity that doesn't really track any financial anything, at the end of the day, you are going to need to um, make good on the, the uh, promise that there is returns, if, not, if, if in no other way than productivity, for the investment in wellness. 
It may be that the return is that you know that it's the right thing to do at a corporate level, but you need to establish that baseline. That can be a health risk assessment questionnaire. It can be biometric screening, and you as a corporation get a blind roll-up report so you know, oh, wow, when we did that the first time, what I learned is that 30% of my employees were pre-hypertensive. Do you know what we did? We bought blood pressure cuffs and gave them out to everybody so that they could be aware of that and monitor it. Take evasive action. I would have never dreamed that that was an issue in my population. Now, you know, you can look around and figure out that there's, you know, overweight people and they may or may not have blood pressure. We never knew until we looked at the data. It gives us a baseline. Years later, the baseline has changed, and that's a good thing. So measurement metrics, a little few more details you can take. Um, the idea is figure out what your population needs. What percentage are smokers? What percentage are overweight? What percentage have chronic diseases? What, what's your productivity and absentee numbers? Measure those things. Have them be in black and white. And it's from that data and, and putting that juxtaposed to your budget that you can actually say, okay, here's the best plan that we should do. If you do a, a risk questionnaire and find out that an exorbitant number of your population smokes, then you may want to say the best use of our resources is to pay for smoking cessation for anybody who wants it and maybe even for their spouses. Because if you've got a limited budget, doing a, a targeted solution over a longer period of time is going to change your population more than spraying little bits of money in lots of different directions. You will never know the best direction to go in, especially with a limited budget, unless you go for getting the data out the gate. Now, there are what I call one-off solutions. And you can also call them the, I call them the you're picking on me program. Okay, these are kind of more public things. They're more direct things. This is like smoking and overweight and whatnot. The reason I put this slide in here is I want you to look at the picture. And that is when you roll out a program for smoking cessation or weight loss or whatever it might be, even if it's just a healthy food um, program, if you've got employees that feel like the girl in the red sweater, you've got a problem. And you need to know before you roll out the program how exactly you are going to manage that problem. Because that looks like a lawsuit to me when that employee who felt like the girl in the red sweater becomes a disgruntled ex-employee. You just have to know it's all well-intended, it's all good, but remember this slide. Remember the iceberg slide and remember the girl in the red sweater slide. When you roll it out, know before you roll it out how you're going to manage those situations. So let's look at a couple of one-offs. Smoking cessation programs are a really, really good example. You find out a large percentage of your population smoke or even a small percentage of your population smoke. We know it is, I told you before, it is the single most preventable cause of disease in our society, smoking in and of itself. So what would you do? Well, you can do the, uh, we're going to charge you a differential contribution if you smoke. What I would suggest if you're going to do this is provide a 6- to 12-month grace period because this is hard stuff. People aren't going to stop smoking on a dime. They have to want to. Money may help them be motivated, but ultimately they need a motivation other than money. Money can get them over the hump. So if you've got a differential in contribution or if you pay for the smoking cessation program itself, that's important. Give them a grace period, though. Dear employees, we're going to be rolling this out January 1, 2012. Know that you now have nine months to figure out how to stop smoking because then we're going to change the, the have a differential contribution that's going to be very substantial. But don't tell them in, all, in April, in April 1st, we're going to make this change because it feels punitive. And the point is, remember, this is long term, not short term. You also want to consider allowing people to move back and forth mid-year between the, the, the um, smoking contribution and the non-smoking contribution. Because if they, if, they, if they fall off the bandwagon once, then what's their motivation to be honest with you about it, number one, and what's their motivation to get back on the bandwagon and stop smoking again if they're locked into the higher contribution for a longer period of time? These are the kind of details that you need to look at when you think about putting in a one-off program. Next one-off program is a weight management thing. We have employers all over having employed biggest loser competition. 
You know, the biggest loser is this, the biggest Okay, those are great. They're very public programs. They can be very motivating to some people, especially when you've got someone in your population who really takes it to heart and loses 10 or 20 pounds or 50 pounds or whatever they may need to lose. Understand, the way that you do this is you, you could create a big old, hairy, biggest loser competition. It takes energy. It takes somebody to manage it. That can be a good thing. You have to be aware of that kind of girl in the red sweater thing. Just be aware of that. Don't forget that. But you can also do that by saying, we will sponsor 50% of the cost of Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig or whatever program floats your boat for the people who participate, and you can put participation requirements on it. You'll say, we'll pay if you go. We'll pay if you go X number of times. We'll pay. You can say any of those things. Remember, they all need to be participation-based. We cannot say, we'll pay if you have a lower BMI, or we'll pay if you don't eat certain things or do lose weight or whatever. Those are kind of uh, achievement or performance-based things, and that doesn't fly under the HIPAA discrimination test. But you want to look at environmental factors that are going to sabotage the programs that you have. You're going to have this big old weight loss thing, then you maybe want to look at what's in the vending machine first. So those are some basic ideas on what I would call one-off solutions. And then there's also the fitness and exercise thing. If you've got somebody who's, you know, kind of like a, can really rally the troops behind having a competition between, you know, sales team and the marketing team and the customer service team on how many miles they can walk, those are good things. But understand, if you're, if you're doing a one-off, I don't mean one-off in terms of only happening once. I mean you're to taking a focused approach over a long-term period of time. And the key question you ask yourself is, how are we going to sustain this over a long period of time? We're going to do a competition for how much you can walk in April, and then we're going to do it again in June, and then we're going to do it again in August, then we're going to do it again in 2012. The idea is long period of time, one-off means focus, one-off does not mean short-term. So then we have what I call a comprehensive wellness program where you've got the data and the baseline and you're, you've got a multifaceted approach to wellness. You've got fitness, nutrition, weight loss, smoking, stress management, health, life balance. You've got all these comprehensive programs. Your large employers typically will incorporate all of these things. This, is a more comprehensive program better than a one-off? Maybe, but not necessarily. I would argue any day that a well-executed long-term commitment to a one-off program is going to be better than a perfect execution of a comprehensive program in the fizzle after a year. So the, the, then people are very reticent to accept that something less could be better than something more. I'm a really big believer in something long-term, well-executed, um, and, and simpler is going to be a better solution for many employers than trying to bite off more than they can chew um, and doing some big comprehensive program. It doesn't mean it's not a right thing. Comprehensive programs aren't good but just know that they come with um, more commitment required. On here, a couple of things at the bottom that are important. Um, there's a billion different vendors that want to sell you their thing. There is a, as many out there th that are good. There are many, many, many good programs. Carefully consider your company culture. How is it going to be received? You need to know that beforehand. Make it fun. Nobody likes a drag. You have to make it fun in order to engage people, and it's a good idea to brand it if you're doing a comprehensive uh, program. So that's just a basic overview of comprehensive wellness programs. This is important. When you're thinking about wellness programs, first thing you want to think about is, I will not recreate the wheel. I will not recreate the wheel. I will not recreate the wheel. Remember that. Take a look at what's good in your culture and capitalize on that. Large employers typically create these fully customized programs, but you don't have to do that. You don't have to do it in your own organization. Leverage what's already there and realize that there are a lot of very, very comprehensive and quality turnkey programs that you can plug in without having to rethink everything. Those are very, very cost effective. So know that if you're on a budget, you're a small employer or a mid-sized employer, Use a CAM solution. Research them and find the one that best fits your culture, but don't feel like you have to have this fully customized, amazing thing that's just unique to your corporation. Use the resources that are out there in the marketplace. Let's talk for a moment about incentives, the carrot or the stick. The carrot wins, folks. The carrot wins all day, every day. 
disincentives are a downer, and they have very negative consequences. The state of Alabama put in a smoking cessation penalty, a, a, a stick, if you will, years ago, and there was so much up for anti-smoking. Uh, there was so much uproar, they rolled it back before it even got rolled out. It's the same, you can take the same budget and frame it as a carrot or frame it as a stick. Just let me save you the hassle, always go with the carrot. And Ray Lee, just a heads up, we only have a few more minutes. Right. Okay. I have been talking too much and too long and having way too much fun. Thank you. And I know you're going fast, but you might have to cherry pick the key points on the next few slides just to meet our uh, end of the hour deadline. Thank you for the reminder, Amy. I appreciate that. Um, so eligibility incentives, what you need to be aware of here is you need to have a substantial amount of money on the table. I'm going to slide ahead. Eligibility means you cannot participate in our health plan unless you do the health risk assessment or the um, um, uh, participate in the health risk questionnaire. I'm going to skip over some of these slides, and I do apologize, uh, but I do want to stop on incentives. My belief is if you pay them, they will at least have a prayer of doing it. Far too many wellness programs have come and gone on movie tickets, uh, T-shirts, and mugs. Don't go there. You need to have real budget on the table. And many people will say, I think you need to have more than $1,000 per person on the table as incentives because then you at least have a chance of changing their behavior. And the whole points thing, you can do that if you want, but what you need to do is recognize that different things motivate different people. Susie may want a new garage door and Harry may want to be able to go on vacation and Anna may want something different. Money is the universal thing. Where are you going to come up with that money if you don't have the budget? The money comes from the future. If you have a 2% salary increase across the board, you go to your C staff and says, here's the, here's the deal. I would like to suggest it's 1.5% across the board, and we take a half a percent of total compensation and fun it, fun, funnel it toward wellness incentives. There, I just funded your whole wellness program, half a percent of your compensation. If you can't do half a percent in one year, do a quarter percent. Now, I get that doesn't work if you're increasing, if you're not increasing salaries. But if you are increasing salaries, siphon some off. Doesn't work this year, but if you're looking at compensation changes next year, siphon some off. Because then if someone wants their 2%, all they need to do is do the well behaviors and you will be able to have the money available to pay them. And I get that that doesn't exactly work because 2% of someone who's making $200,000 a year is the same with someone who's making $50,000 a year. That's okay. That's where you need to see staff buy-in. They need to understand the importance of it. But that's an important tip I just gave you in terms of where do you find money for wellness. And I'm going to suggest to you that if your corporation can't get their hands around that concept, you have a non-starter on your hands. Go and do something else. Have a good benefits plan. Have a good recruiting plan. Put an HRIS system. But scrap wellness. Because if you don't have that kind of commitment, it will, if that is reflective, that commitment is reflective of what it really needs to be to say we are creating a culture of wellness. We're not creating a wellness program, if you will. And I, I outline there where the money is coming from. I'm going to skip over the questions and get to a, um, a couple of things at the very end here. I'm going to skip my case study as well. Um, this is and a that's fine because what I think we're going to do is just have you um, uh, finish up and then we'll answer questions offline because I know we do have to wrap it up for the budgeted amount of time that we have, which is fine because we can right. just answer questions offline. Fair enough. Um, so let me talk for a moment about C-level support. As I mentioned before, you have to, um, you have, to have it. It's a non-starter if you don't. In answer to the question of how do I get it, sharing some of the statistics is important and sharing the reality of what you need from a C-level support perspective is also important. And accepting that if you don't have it, it's a bummer. It's a big bummer. But recognize that you don't, and frankly, don't go there. Don't start something if you don't have that C-level support. But sharing the iceberg, looking at some of those ROI statistics, and importantly, if you can have someone in the organization operate kind of as a champion, if you will, of it. You've got someone at the sea level who has figured out that their life is better when they exercise or when they cut out fast food. That is usually a good thing. Let me uh, talk for a moment about resource needs. 
And this is where the C level comes in. You cannot pretend to run a program without real resources. You need resources for incentives. You need resources for the program itself. You need human resources. You need communication resources. You need that capital, the people. You need to have a champion behind your program, and that costs money. And if you've got everybody that's maxed out on your staff, and you throw it on John Doe and say, well, you're going to have the wellness program too, you have not put adequate resources if it's just one more thing for someone to do. It needs to be carved out regular parts of their responsibilities in order to be real. I have 10 critical factors for success, which I will, I will um, finish with. You need executive level buy-in and ongoing support. That's obviously critical. You need to form a wellness committee and have a wellness champion. It's not just going to happen itself. On an ongoing basis, it has to be there. You need to analyze and completely understand your culture so that you can make a good decision about putting it in. You need to communicate, 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 over-communicate, kill them with communication. is going to be critically important for the success of any program. You need to incentivize them. And as I mentioned before, the movie tickets and the T-shirts just ain't going to cut it in the long term. You need to have a defined budget and resources for the long term, and you need to know what it is in advance so you can make good decisions. You need to provide confidentiality assurance to the employees. They, do, they want to know that you don't really care and aren't going to know whether they're having donuts that morning or whether they've run a mile. That confidentiality is really important, or whether they have diabetes or whether they have high blood pressure. Confidentiality is critically important. You need to understand your baseline. Don't go start unless you know where the starting line is. And you need to look for incremental and change and engagement. It will happen. You do need to measure it, but it is going to be incremental. You're not going to wake up one morning and go, wow, everybody stop smoking. If you're looking for that, you're looking for love in all the wrong places. You've got to look for the increments and be happy with those. And you want to expect that you're going to need to track and measure your results over the long term. I I apologize that I had to cancel (laughs) my hand, but that gives you a little bit of an overview of some of the tools um, and some of the key elements that are going to be critical for success of your program. Well, Ray Lee, we had an ambitious agenda today. We knew that, but what can I say? We're, we're optimists. So um, I want to thank you so much for speed educating us today on the value of wellness plans, giving us some insight. You have a really well-documented slide deck that is informative. Obviously, your um, contact information is, is available on the slides. People can contact me as well to get in contact with you. So any future questions um, and the questions that came in we weren't able to address, we will get back to, to those of you um, who have those questions. I want to thank you all for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you at future HR Options webinars.